Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Armenian Institute. Uh, for those of you here in person and our friends online. Tonight, we are remembering Herant Dink, who was tragically killed in 2007 outside his office. With us tonight, we are honored to have Nayat Karakosh and Karim Karakashli joining us from Istanbul, Noemi Dusimet Metier, who will be performing for us, and Nuritza Matosyan, who will be hosting this evening's commemoration. My name is Tatiana Deravidisian. I'm a trustee of the Armenian Institute. For those of you that aren't familiar with us, we are a leading Armenian arts and cultural uh, charity in the UK, and we aim to make Armenian culture and history a living experience. We hold one of the largest collections of Armenian books in Europe, um, and you can learn more about us by visiting our website. Before I hand over to our host this evening, to some general housekeeping. For those of you online, please ensure that you are muted at all times. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat and we will share them with the moderator. For those here in person, you can raise your hand um, at the end to ask questions to our speakers. Please note this event is recorded and will be hosted on YouTube um, after the event. So please turn off your camera if you do not want to be recorded. And for anyone in the room, please let us know if you'd rather um, your image not be used. Our host and moderator this evening is no stranger to AI. She's one of the organization's co-founders and a former director. Naritza is a writer, performer, and human rights activist with documentary films to her credit, including um, the award-winning Herant Dink, Hearts of Two Nations. She first introduced Herant Dink to London, where she filmed his historic lecture and their conversations together. She published biographies on, on the composer of the composer, um, Yanis Xenagis and the American Armenian artist Ashil Gorky. Nuritza. Good evening, Paririgun, Merhaba. Very good to see you all here today. We are here and you've joined us to remember Hanti again. Today, he would have been 67 years old, 16 years since he was cruelly murdered and robbed of his life. The myth goes before him. Who was Herant Dink? For me, Herant Dink was the bravest and most original Armenian I have ever had the great fortune to meet. He was courageous to the, per the point of recklessness and optimistic beyond imagination. His empathy was for all people, Armenians in Turkey like himself, Armenians in the diaspora, Turks in Turkey, minorities living in Turkey. I never once heard him insult someone on the basis of race or creed. His mission was to help people understand, respect and reconcile one another. And this he did through his Armenian Turkish newspaper, Agos. Yes, he even mentioned the unnameable Armenian genocide and he published it. And for that, he paid the cruel price. We were lucky to host him, as uh, Tatiana said, in London for the first and last time in 2006. And it was straight after he had um, he addressed the Ankara parliament and he was in a very optimistic mood and very often talking about how important it was for Turkey actually to become a member of the European Union, which didn't happen. His spirit of fellowship among people of different cultures and understanding uh, has been emphasized and he has been granted and offered awards all over the world, including posthumously. The Haranthin Foundation is a shining beacon for human rights and it is founded in Istanbul and we will be talking to uh, Nayat and Karim Karakosh immediately after this. It monitors hate speech, fosters meetings between the Armenians and the Turkish young, improving democratization in Turkey. It publishes and does much more and we're lucky to have them with us today from Istanbul. In Osman Bey, Istanbul, outside the offices of Agos, people congregated in the last two days to pay their respects. 
doves flew across the building in a video projection, recalling his last words. In the minds of all these people was the same thing, and the renowned filmmaker, Emin Alper, spoke from the window of her aunt's office to the people below. And he said, her aunt's blood is not dry. It still flows. Justice has not been done. The instigators of his murder and others have not been brought to justice. And in fact, other human rights defenders are still being incarcerated. And we remember and salute philanthropist Osman Kavala, sentenced to life imprisonment, and more recently, Guru Fernandji, who was, who was head of the Medical Association of Turkey and former head of Human Rights Foundation. Writers, teachers, mayors, and others, 65 journalists currently detained or imprisoned. I will simply ask you now to join me and join Naya Karakosh, who is going to talk, take us to the site of memory of the Haranti Foundation and give us a virtual <coughs> tour. Naya Karakosh is a firm friend of the Armenian Institute and before the pandemic, she came from Istanbul to speak to us for the commemoration of Haranti. Nayad received her BA in sociology from Galatai University. She holds degrees in human rights from the University of Essex. She was uh, also an inter fellow for the human rights at Columbia University in University of Washington. And since 2015, Nayad works as the program coordinator of the Rantik Foundation. Her various roles are developing and designing projects on hate speech, discrimination, minority rights, and dealing with the past. Other roles include project coordination, fundraising, networking with national and international stakeholders. Nayad coordinates the 23.5 site of memory. And this is the first memory site in Turkey dedicated to ranting and to the values that he embraced, such as democracy, justice, peace, human rights, and dialogue. We've asked Naya to take us on a tour, and we will see a kind of facsimile of Ranting's office with many of the pictures, the furniture, and objects which I remember when visiting him. Naya, hello, welcome hello. to London. Hello everyone, hope everyone can hear me and uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. It's an honor to be here. Three years ago I was there in person again for the commemoration event this year through Zoom and still very happy. Well, as Naritza well uh, summarized, uh, today, tonight, I'll try to take you to a virtual tour of our memory site. And uh, I should say that the site is established in 2019 and it's been operating since then. You can think of it as a museum and every day we are receiving visitors uh, from Turkey and outside Turkey as well. And recently, of course, you know, it has been a very moving week for the commemoration and the commemoration was held in front of the memory site now, what we call it. And thousands of people turned out again and which was still like, you know, uh, kind of elevating our hopes because there's an immense amount of solidarity, I should say. Now I will share my screen. Um, yes, just a second. Um, are you able to see it now? Not yet. Not yet. I'll try to share. Now? It's launching. Now, can you see? Yes, yeah, you yes, just need perfect. to make it full screen, Naya, done. Okay. Well, um, this is kind of the entrance of our memory site. I should say that uh, this site used to be the former office of Agos newspaper. 
Uh, for those who don't know, Agos was established in 1996, and it was the first newspaper to be published in the Republican era in Turkish and in Armenian as well. So with Agos, we started to see how, in fact, Armenians started to become visible and the issues regarding Armenians' minority rights started to enter in the public agenda. And over the course of time, with the efforts of Hrant Ting and Agos newspaper, Armenians started to shift from being passive citizens to active citizens because they found their voice and courage in the newspaper's mission. So the Agos newspaper operated from this venue till 2015. I should also say that the foundation was established a couple of months after Hrantling's assassination in 2007 in order to continue his legacy, his dreams about equality, about justice, about peace, coexistence, and democratization of Turkey. Well, over the course of time, both the newspaper and the foundation grew, so we couldn't fit in, basically. So we started to have these conversations about moving out to a new premises uh, back in 2012. But one of the questions that many people were asking us, what are you going to do with the former site? Because unfortunately, Hrant Ding was assassinated right in front of this building. And from the night of January 19th, this space became a site of conscience in the public conscience and started to have a very significant place in the collective uh, memory of the society as well. So we felt that responsibility and we decided to turn this site into a memory site. So in order to do that, we conducted a very long preparation stage for five years where we visited different memory sites from different parts of the world. We met with many experts, brought them in Turkey, you know, thought together, and we did a lot of meetings to ask people, what kind of a site would you like to see? What should we refrain from? What would uh, intimidate you? Or what would you know, be, what would you be curious about finding in this site? So after this five years of preparation, we turned this space into a memory site and it was opened on uh, 23rd of April 2019. Well, the name is 23 and a half Hranting Site of Memory. We were inspired by Hranting's article 23 and a half April that he penned in April, 23rd of April 1996 at Agos newspaper. Well, in that article, Hranting was describing his feelings between 23rd of April, which is a day that the Turkish parliament was established. It's a day of sovereignty, but at the same time, it's a holiday dedicated to the children of the world. Well, as you know, 24th of April, which is the following day, is a painful day for Armenians all around the world, but also especially in Turkey, because Armenians are not able to commemorate the genocide as the way that they wish there's still politics of denial, and it's a more sorrowful day. So Hrant Ding was trying to describe his feelings in between those both days. But at the same time, he was making a call because as 23rd April is a day, well, uh, it is a holiday dedicated to the children of the world, he was saying that invite all the children, but also invite children from Armenia as well so that they can solve this problem. So it very much resonated with the mission of our memory site, because what we wanted to do is what we have learned, in fact, during the preparation stage, although those sites, they shelter a heavy memory, or most of them are the places where horrendous events have occurred, there are also the sites that are trying to encourage people to act, to do something. So it's a bridge between the pain of the past and the hope for the future. So we wanted to name this site as 23 and a half. So in this space, one of the singularities of the site is the fact that Hran Ting is the main narrator himself. He guides the visitors through the whole exhibit. We were lucky because we had a very large video archive. And what we have learned during all this preparation stage as well is that Memory sites are more of a question rather than an answer. They ask questions and also they encourage the visitors to question the things, the things or the facts they think that they know. So we have many videos in this site and each video starts with a question. 
Um, for instance, here, we ask this question, what am I struggling in Turkey? So when you click, it's Hrant Dink who replies himself. So, so also in this section, we try to give the different snapshots from different periods of his life. And we exhibit some objects as well, like his business card. Because in his business card, we know that you know, his name is written as Fratting. And it's the fact that many Armenians in Turkey still print their business cards with a Turkish name to avoid any act of discrimination. So by asking this you know, simple question, do you know people who have to hide their real names because of who they are? We are trying to encourage our visitors to think about what it means to be hiding your identity, to you know, kind of uh, living in a secret way, especially in certain environments as well. Um, here we have his uh, passport, because maybe many of you don't know. Uh, Huran Think got his first passport at the age of 48. Can you imagine? Like, he couldn't travel at all. Each time he applied, you know, he was rejected. So his first travels started after the age of 48. And it was the last six years of his life. So he traveled basically all around the world from Australia to America to South America and he built this uh, dialogue and relations with the diaspora as well and after those visits he was uh, he created a special page at the newspaper saying that uh, in the name of uh, my passport is in my pocket and he was sharing his impressions from those visits so I will move to our corridor sorry here. So in the corridor, you will see a collage of the newspapers, of Agos newspapers. It's like a time tunnel because at the same time, we are trying to shed light on the near history of Turkey, the different developments. Because when Agos was established in 1996, it was a very difficult period in Turkey. It was a very dark period, like mid 90s. There was war in southeastern Turkey, and Armenians were constantly being blamed and inst insulted. So that was a very uh, critical period. But Hurantink and his friends, they took a very brave step to establish this newspaper. On the other hand, uh, from the 2000s, it was more like more hopeful process, I would say, because there was EU accession process, democratic reforms, and Agos was a very activist newspaper. You will see in many headlines that Agos is calling the, you know, presidents, the prime ministers, saying that you know these are the problems, but also these are the steps that you should take. So it's a newspaper, not only highlighting the problem, but at the same time trying to be part of the solution by proposing solid and concrete steps. So here we have a room called Turtaba based on Hranting's own personal story, because I should say that many of the rooms in the memory site are created from Hranting's personal story. In Turtrava, we shed light on his experience in the military service. He served in the army in 1986, and back then in Denizli, and back then he was um, already married with kids, but as you may guess, he was subject to discrimination. So in the, after the first month of the military service in Turkey, there is an oath ceremony. You swear and you take an oath and they announce whether you are promoted or not. While all of his friends were promoted to a higher rank, he wasn't, which meant that he would be forced to do, to do more hard labor work, like all night long watches as well. So he felt very upset. And after that ceremony, he took a walk and he found the tin shed with, with the walls like this. And he cried, and so did he cry. His cry wasn't heard. With a key, he started to scratch the walls to make a sound so that you know, his cry wouldn't be heard. So we dedicated this room to our visitors as well, because each of us, we have different stories. It can be stories of uh, discrimination uh, or stories of how we, overcame this discrimination. So what we have learned again uh, in terms of memory sites, 
these are the spaces of expression, of sharing as well. So here, uh, our visitors sit on this chair and uh, just opposite, there's a screen. And if they want to record and share their story, they do share. And if they let us, they become part of this exhibit as well. Sorry, sorry, I have a connection problem. I have to refresh, I guess. I will just pause it and sorry. I'll take you to now. I'll take you to the room of Agos newspaper, where we tell the story of the newspaper, uh, the impact that the newspaper made, <clears throat> and Karin will tell maybe better because she was uh, there from the very beginning, and she spent many uh, years in this newspaper office. But Agos was a trailblazing newspaper, as I said, and here. We have the digital archive of the newspaper, also the hard copy archive. So the visitors are able to make in-depth researches as well. Here we can see the pictures of people visiting Agos or pictures of Ranting visiting different countries. And we also dedicated this wall to this uh, announcement called, I'm searching, looking for my relatives. Because from the very beginning, uh, one of the main missions of the newspaper was to find and reunite Armenians with their lost relatives, especially after uh, 1915. And as you know, there are many, many Islamized Armenians in Turkey. And we don't have the exact numbers, but for the estimated number is like there's at least two, three millions of Islamized Armenians. And years ago, we also organized a conference on the Islamized Armenians. And on the virtual side, you will be able to access uh, these recordings of the conference as well. Well, uh, there are many different moving stories of uh, how Armenians or Islamized Armenians found their own families. We try to uh, feature some of them in here, but I should say that one of the things that we noticed with the site is that many people come in here, they start sharing their own family histories, and some of them, they share it for the first time because they tell that after visiting this site, they are encouraged to speak about this family history that is kept as a secret even with the, uh, within the family as well. So in this room, uh, this is one of the like difficult rooms. We are telling how Hranting became a target step by step, the events that led to his assassination. Um, well, for those who don't know, uh, it all started with the Sabia Gökçen news story. Uh, Sabia Gökçen is one of the adopted uh, children of Atatürk, and she's the first woman war, uh, woman war pilot in the world. Uh, so Hrant Dink uh, learned that she was in fact an Armenian. Uh, she was an orphan from 1915. So they reached to her family, and when he published this news, it made a huge echo in Tur Turkey, especially when three weeks after Hurriyet newspaper, the main leading uh, mainstream newspaper back then, carried this news story in its headlines, it created a huge backlash. Many people started to attack Ranting, saying that how dare you can claim that Atatürk's adopted daughter is Armenian. They uh, thought it's an insult to Turkishness because she was, as I said, uh, part of the military. She was the first woman war pilot. She had this national heroine figure as well. So after Hurriyet news story, a day after 
the general heads uh, army, like the head of the military, they issued a statement targeting Huranting. And two days after he was called to the governorship of Istanbul and he was threatened uh, there. And after that, we see how he becomes a target in the, of the hate speech in the media. And a few uh, weeks and months after, Article 301 trial started against him. Well, this article is about denigrating and insulting Turkishness. And some people, for one of his articles on Armenian identity, where he was making, in fact, a metaphor about that, you know, poisonous blood, but in fact, he was criticizing more uh, some of the diaspora Armenians who couldn't, you know, let go of this uh, hatred uh, that was poisoning us. But it was totally misunderstood and misinterpreted on purpose. And we see many different carbon copy uh, kind of petitions from different cities of Turkey uh, wanting Huranting to be tried under Article 301. So another harsh process started for him. There we see in these videos as, as well, a Huranting who tries to explain himself over and over that he would never insult Turkishness. And he's not a racist person. So he tells in every single place, like the conferences that he attends, the TV programs that uh, he appears, but only some people heard him and many people thought that, no, this wasn't the case. So within a span of three years, we see how on an accelerated pace, he becomes a target. And unfortunately, as you know, uh, three years after on January 19th, he was killed right in front of the newspaper uh, office. Here um, in this room, we shed light on, uh, sorry, again, I have connection problem, uh, Camp Armen. Uh, we call it, maybe I will just pass it on later. So here we see Hranting's room. We kept it as it was in 2007. Um, of course, there were some uh, modifications after uh, Hranting Foundation's move to this office venue, but we wanted to keep it in the original state. So here we can see many uh, pictures, objects, and uh, all these you know, small figures. And we can say that most of them are related to Armenian culture and history. And from this room, we also offer a specially designed guided tour about Armenian culture and history. For instance, here you see Gomidas Vartabet. And many people in Turkey, as there is no history on the multicultural past of the society, they don't know about Gomidas Vartabet. So we tell his story, who he was, or Arshil Gorky here. And here we have a, a video from Nuritsa's documentary uh, called, well, maybe we can play it. There's no sound, Nayat. Oh, sorry. Sorry, maybe I didn't uh, open the share sound. So this is a part of uh, Nuritsa's uh, documentary where he also sings this uh, song, uh, says the uh, Psalm 23rd. Sorry, I again have a connection problem, I guess, because... I will reconnect again. I'm sorry for this. Can you see now? Not yet. Not yet. So 
Sorry, it will take me a while. The joys of hybrid. The joys of hybrid. The joys of hybrid. <laughs> While we're waiting, I'll just tell you that um, after this, we will have a, uh, a song from um, uh, the Vicinetia, just so you can reflect and um, uh, wait again. Because it's such a rich, it's such a rich environment, what we're watching, isn't it? There, there are so many references and so much to take in. Very, very layered uh, experience listening to, um, to Naya. So <clears throat> Noemi Vicinetia, uh, I will introduce her. She's a folk singer and electronic producer, and she is now training in medieval chant with the Idrissi Ensemble. And they have been training in Corsica, in Greece, and uh, where else? Um, uh, London. In London, <laughs> yes. And uh, they, they lead this experimental soul, and she leads an experimental soul project called Moon. Uh, she's going to sing to us afterwards. I chant from a troubadour tradition uh, from the Occitan. Is anything are we right? From the Occitan. And I think this is this will be lovely because we also have uh, traditional troubadour songs in, in from Armenia, uh, the Ashoks, the songs of the Ashoks. So there's a sort of parallel here between the two. And uh, she's going to sing a song which is a love song, but to me it sounds like a lament. After that, yeah, we'll yeah. have Karin Karakashli speaking with me about her experience of working on the newspaper. And, uh, and um, th then we continue with another song with some questions. You can ask some questions. Uh, if you are online, please write them into the chat column so that we can see your questions. And we will end with a folk song, an Armenian folk song, again from Noemi. How are we doing? Naya, to you. Yes, I'm back. Uh, so, so from Granting Room, uh, we are now in the salt and light installation by artist Sarkis, because this space used to be the former uh, terrace of the uh, <clears throat> space, but it was like used like an archive. So we wanted to create also a space for reflection and commemoration. And artist Sarkis was born in Turkey and then he moved to Paris and he's become one of the most important contemporary artists. So this room has many different symbolisms. So on the walls you know these are the original layers of the wall color because we engraved we thought that you know we would paint this over but Sarkis advised us to leave it as it is and there were cracks on the wall as you can see here as well and Sarkis's vision is based on uh, creating trade treasure out of pain turning that pain into something beautiful so he wanted to use the Kintsugi technique that the Japanese people use when there is a broken vase or another like, you know, a plate, they fix it uh, by uh, putting silver or gold grains. So he used the same method in heal here. And he said, we can heal our wounds together. And on the wall, you would see uh, those tamatas, what we call, you take it from the churches. And if you want to wish something, you to take it uh, as the shape of a house, heart. And we found this in Huran Ting's drawer chest in a box. Probably somebody made a gift to him. So Sarkis wanted to hang them on the wall. And he said that invites uh, our visitors as well to bring their own and to hang them on the wall so that we, we can amplify the good feelings and good wishes. Here you can see the biography book of Tuba Chandar in a form of clock. Uh, because Sarkis usually creates this book clocks and it was hung here from the very first day to witness now, present and also to keep in mind the past. And here we see a neon light. It's in the shape of uh, Tuzla Camp Armen. Uh, in the next room, I will show you the Kampar Men, but it has a very significant place in Hranting's life because 
uh, during his childhood, during the summertime, he used to go to this camp, our men, and he met with his wife, Raquel Ding, in the camp. And they grew up there. They contributed to the camp. And later on, even they became the managers and looked after many kids. But unfortunately, the camp was one of the confiscated properties uh, of Armenians, which became a very painful fact for Hran Ting, and he was trying to make voice for the camp. Wow. And uh, Sarkis wanted to create this neon light in the shape of the building of Camp Armen. And when you come to the venue, it has a beat as if Hran Ting's heart is beating still. And below we have a candle. If anyone wants to light a candle, they should be also able to light a candle as well. So I will take you to Kamparmen uh, building uh, room, Atlantis civilization room. But again, sorry, my connection doesn't allow me, but I summarize, maybe later on I can show a picture because I don't want to take uh, more of your time. So this is our memory site, uh, but you can also visit this online in Turkish, in English as well and listen to all the content of it. And uh, we are receiving, maybe I should uh, note this, like thousands of visitors so far. And mostly non-Armenians are coming to the site. And we are working with the youth as well. We created some learning programs on human rights, on democracy, on memory sites, on Armenian culture. And um, for 2000. Uh, 23, one of our main plans is to continue and do more work with school groups, with youths, uh, because like, as I said, you know, unfortunately in Turkey, there is no uh, lesson course on the multicultural past of the society. And we believe that the works of NGOs and the memory sites can fill this important gap as well. And um, 23 and a half is recently nominated for the European Museum of the Year Award, uh, which will be presented in um, May. So we will learn the results during the ceremony in Barcelona. So it has also become an international uh, place in that sense as well. And what I can say briefly, <clears throat> our visitors really elevate our hopes in that sense, because we see that many youth are coming and these young people, they were like babies or kids when Hranting died. And they discovered Armenians through Hranting. And we seen, we are seeing that, you know, the seeds that he planted back then are now grow growing and blossoming in many new souls. And I always like give sometimes reference to Feru Faruzat, Iranian poems, this excellent uh, uh, word saying that the bird may die, but keep the flight in mind. So I feel like his flight is still continuing through the work of the foundation, through the hearts and minds of this uh, people, this society. Yes, this is a very challenging time for Turkey now, and not everything is bright, but still we don't want to give up on hope and continue our mission uh, from the memory side as well. Thank you. So much, Maya. That was really a much deeper experience than I expected, even though it was online. <laughs> and uh, you explained it so well. I wish, I hope I can come and see it myself. It's very I true. hope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, now we'll talk, now we will hear Noemi, who is going to sing to us. Um, this, what is the what is it called actually? Your song. I don't know what it's called. We just call it Adam. Uh, which is the first word of the song. That's, that's kind of how it goes with medieval music. Mm -hmm. It tends to be, the songs tend to be named after the first word in the song. Right, and, and she's using a kamani, which uh, just for the drone, not because she wants to accompany herself, but just in order to have a drone to sing to. Thank you. And it is a love song, but um, do you want to say that? Yeah. It's a love song, but I love her. Is die in battle, so it, it is a lament. Ah, so. <laughs>
Karin, are you there? <laughs> I'm looking for Karin. Oh, of course. Oh, you're on mute. Hello. Hello. <coughs> uh, are you muted or are you, are you okay? Can I, uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm oh, here. Hello. So let me introduce you. Um, Karin Karakosh, yeah, was, um, she graduated in translation and interpreting studies. And from 1996 to 2006, she worked with the, the uh, British Army Indian newspaper Argos as editor, head of the editorial department, and columnist on both Turkish and Armenian pages. She's completed an MA in comparative literature, works in a, as a translation instructor at the university, and as a teacher of Armenian language and literature in an Armenian high school. And currently, she's a columnist at both Agos and Radical newspapers, and she continues to write fiction and poetry. And she's written several children's novels. She's also the co writer of a research book, Türkiye'de Ermeniler Cemaat Birey Yurtaş, Armenians in Turkey, Community Individual Citizen. My dear. So good to have you with us. I'm going to take you back to the very beginning. What was it that made you go and work for uh, Agos in the first place? Well, as it is the case with Ranting, actually, you do not have your plans. Uh, rather, uh, he is the determining factor, I, I would uh, say. Uh, he came to an award ceremony for my first published um, short stories. And at that time in 1995, uh, there was no newspaper at all. He was in his capacity as this owner of the bookshop. And as the competition was all organized by a, another fellow one, uh, he heard that an Armenian girl uh, was awarded and uh, was there aside uh, my mom and dad and the first striking thing was that when there is something to be happy uh, your family uh, is there of course to rejoice you but other than that when a complete stranger is uh, happier than the rest uh, you are struck who is this man? And uh, I remember now uh, your uh, description of uh, him as the as an original Armenian. That's that's true because I haven't met uh, an Armenian like him. I did I didn't even uh, thought about what a typical Armenian is, but generally speaking. Uh, we may say, well, uh, there was this 
moderate type, uh, having an invisible life, uh, busy with trade and the uh, local ceremonies at best, uh, visiting the church, uh, living a peaceful life, as invisible as possible. But he was shining with energy. Um, and this joy uh, was actually contagious. So uh, after a couple of months, uh, he called me again and said that there was this preparation uh, for a new newspaper, bilingual one. And this was a revolution in itself, as Nayat so perfectly uh, summarized, because for the first time, uh, Armenians uh, would have the opportunity uh, to raise their voices uh, with the language in order to reach out to society and tell both their culture um, as subjects, but also their institutional problems. And uh, rather than being the objects, they would be there as people. Uh, so this was the revolutionary part. And uh, I was actually invited uh, to be interviewed uh, as this uh, newcomer author. But uh, in time when the interview was published, I was already part of the uh, team. Uh, and then when uh, I looked again, there were already 10 years having uh, flight by. And what happened during those 10 years? You, did, did you start off uh, work on specific things? Were you aware of already an editorial line that he had? Or did you sort of work on it and develop them gradually? <laughs> well, the most uh, intriguing and interesting part of the uh, Agos was actually, it was um, a complete, a uh, playground of eager uh, uh, amateurs, volunteers. Uh, neither of us were journalists, not uh, granting uh, as well, but we had some uh, professional uh, Turkish journalist friends and we had a lot of um, hope and stamina all shining again uh, from granting. And we were not afraid to make mistakes to learn during the path. And uh, right before this Sebat apartment office, we started with a, a tinier one where there was uh, the ceiling uh, uh, already uh, leaking, um, all office furniture um, summoned up, cobbled from various houses, and elevators uh, always out of order, or a resident uh, mouse uh, that kept. Uh, skate out, uh, skate on the tiles on the Wednesday evenings when we were trying to come up with the issue. And we played balls with these crumpled up uh, pages, page proofs. It was a period of uh, genuine learning. And uh, we had also our um, veteran journalists of Armenian press, uh, extinguished writers, um, Rupem Mashoyan, Yervant Kobelian, the theater star Hagop Ivas, um, the head of the Armenian section, Sarkis Seropian, each and everyone bringing all their uh, generational, I would say, accommodation. And they were honored to be there. Uh, so we had uh, uh, our visitors coming with their human stories throughout the years. Uh, when they told of a um, missing supposedly Armenian grandmother, grandfather, trying to come up with their roots. And um, on the road, uh, we also learned not only uh, to give news, but uh, to shape the political agenda of the country. Uh, and this is all around things work and his vision, of course, uh, that we were able to reach uh, people and build um, solidarity, attention, uh, that we, as Armenians, became humanized with our stories uh, rather than being labeled as 
traitors uh, or potential uh, enemies uh, because he was uh, very convinced of the strength of the human story. You can reject uh, opinions, uh, but you cannot do anything against the sincere human storytelling. And he was the best of it. Uh, that's why when he came up with his story of Kamparman, Kamparman was no longer a um, forgotten juridical, uh, juristical issue, but the story of a kid growing up there, marrying his love and raising children, and also uh, the hope of being a proud Armenian without uh, giving up uh, his hope of being an equal citizen. Kamparman was also an interesting story even after it was bought by somebody it was sold yes because uh, it was taken away from the armenian uh, armenians because it had been bought by a charity uh, and and this man tried to give it back did he not he tried to hand it back but he wasn't allowed to yeah like it is with all these uh, issues of confiscated properties mm. um, you cannot give back uh, the in just uh, accumulated uh, years uh, of disappointment. Uh, it's a really sad story uh, because there was this uh, child labor. There was this child um, world within it. And when it is the denied themselves, yes. When it is denied, uh, then uh, it automatically shows also uh, why uh, he was um, made to a target long before Agos. He was a political figure in his daily life. And this only enhanced uh, when uh, through Agos, he became uh, maybe against his will to a spokesman, to a non-official spokesman of Armenians in Turkey and Armenian world in general, I would say. All the other Armenian newspapers were very uh, careful to, to not to do anything uh, which which would rock the boat, and and he took a very different approach. He was also then surrounded by journalists who were supporting him, wasn't he? I think that is also an interesting story. Sure, because uh, he had this great power uh, to convince people, ordinary people as well as ambassadors, uh, high-ranking politicians, uh, and even the uh, most nationalistic people, because uh, he would give so much care to be understood properly. And uh, he had this immense, uh, incredible uh, power of empathy. And he uh, always spoke of, um, issues, uh, this is his words, um, I thought I'd best remain on the knife's edge. That's the most secure place for me. And with knife's edge, he uh, emphasizes, I guess, the um, nearly impossible situation of being uh, Armenian of Turkey, being Armenian, giving the value of uh, this identity and being of the of uh, the equal citizen of the country uh, as well, uh, not losing the one uh, for the other. And I think I approach the issues with a courage that oversteps the limits, uh, he said once. And th there is this question of what limits, why limits, whose limits that we have to answer. Uh, and again, his words, I take into account whether anyone I come into contact with has the patience to listen to me. I do everything I can to not hurt them. In the end, it was, uh, he, he himself, he got uh, hurt, and there is this burden that he, uh, he couldn't be protected.
So uh, that's the legacy we are talking about. And that's why his impact is so huge and unwavering, I would say. But he could have been, he could have been protected if the, if the government had, uh, had, had protected him. He asked for protection at the end, did he not? And, and nothing was done when he was getting these death threats constantly. And uh, he knew that he was, he was targeted. And he asked for he asked for security, and he didn't get it. Uh, you know, he also was uh, a man uh, that <clears throat> who always uh, cared to protect uh, the loved ones and the community uh, he came from more than himself. So uh, he was well aware of this alienation process. Of course, he got the support uh, of the. Uh, journalists, authors, and intellectuals, uh, and uh, even the society at that time. But compared to the danger we see now uh, from nowadays, uh, it's of course uh, not enough. And uh, I remember the day when there was this uh, hate demonstration in front of Agos where uh, people were, were shouting, uh, you are the target ranting of our anger, uh, etc. And uh, then uh, he would only feel uh, sorry uh, for the uh, neighboring uh, uh, shop owners. That's uh, that's a day uh, where uh, they somehow got restless. So he will. Uh, carry even this kind of sh uh, shame uh, for himself. And he would then call me, for instance, when we uh, were uh, going out, maybe you should not talk beside me. Uh, you should not talk beside me. And then in the end, we were uh, 100,000 people walking behind him, unfortunately. But he was, he was very well aware of, of the dangers. Uh, I remember when I visited him and I asked him if he always comes in and out from the, from the same doors, whether he sometimes changes his route when he's leaving to go home because he used to go home at night. And, uh, and he said, oh, it doesn't make any difference. You know, he was just, he, uh, he, 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 he didn't want to accept that that was happening. I feel as though he just wanted to ignore it. Completely, yeah. He, this was the huge dilemma. Uh, he would get a package and uh, would call to the secretary, well, this could be a bomb, and meanwhile would wrap the uh, papers out. That, that was typical him uh, with so much uh, foresight, but also uh, this optimism. Mm. So, Guyan, what do you think is um, the role of the newspaper now that he's, he's not there anymore? How, how do you view it? The future of Argos and the importance of Argos? Well, uh, as long as the name Hranting is there uh, in our collective memory, uh, Argos uh, has this uh, symbolic uh, importance. The mission of Argos is now also, since his death in 2007, uh, distributed, uh, I would say, uh, to a great network uh, with the huge efforts of the foundation, but also uh, the new independent uh, media um, agencies and all the uh, efforts of uh, journalists whatsoever. So it's not only on the shoulders of uh, Agos uh, to raise the voice of ranting, but uh, wherever these individuals are believing in his mission and uh, being aware of his story and uh, going nonetheless uh, with the work uh, of peace building as there is no other option uh, left. Otherwise we would be also part of the assassination. We have to believe in his uh, high hopes, uh, even if we sometimes fail individually. That's that's uh, more or less the responsibility, I would say, because otherwise he would get hurt again. 
do you think that the pressure um, against free speech, human rights, is is increasing, uh, making life more difficult for you at, the, at this time? I know I know that the elections are going to come soon, and all sorts of um, excuses and and uh, charges are being brought against people to shut them up or to imprisoning people. How 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 does the how is the atmosphere for for you now? Uh, for me personally, uh, I would say uh, there is uh, not this uh, near threat uh, because of the of being Armenian. Uh, in a way, uh, when the state politics wishes uh, this issue is brought, and all of a sudden uh, you find yourself again with all your story um, as a potential uh, enemy. But now we have, uh, since many years, a more general um, uh, atmosphere of increasing fascism, and um, it uh, reflects all spheres of uh, opponents from, as you have uh, already mentioned, uh, journalists to lawyers to human rights defenders, everybody raising voice for an equal free uh, country. So this is a joint uh, uh, fight and I think uh, that the fact that January 19th has been selected collectively as the day of not only commemorating an Armenian uh, journalist but rather than giving oath to each other uh, for a possible better uh, future is actually the dream uh, he has been lived for, he has lived for. So uh, that's the last victory uh, of him, I would say. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Karin. There's so much more to say, but I don't want to monopolize you. And perhaps other people have some of the audience here in London and um, on Zoom also might want to ask you some questions, but I just want to wish you well, courage, and may the ink always flow from your pen. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the effort. Do you have any questions for uh, Karin or for Naya, actually for either of them? Um, and we're getting some comments here from people sending greetings from the United States and grateful to attend the site of memory. Great to hear you attended the opening. Thanking Nayat very much for the, for the tour from Cumbria. Um, visited the museum in Istanbul during last year. It was a life-changing experience, somebody said. Um, right. So does anyone have a question or a comment? Yes. So uh, I don't understand why the passport has not given to granting since uh, till uh, the age of 48. Did you so, hear that question? The gentleman doesn't understand why Herat didn't have a passport until the age a, of 48. As a Turkish citizen. As a Turkish citizen. As far as I'm concerned. You're sorry. I mean, as far as I understand, I mean, as a Turkish citizen, like that, uh, granting. Yes. Why? Uh, as, yeah. Okay, he he yeah. applied many times, but without any reason. Each time, he, his application was rejected. Probably because he was Armenian, he was also leftist, socialist. So he was just like this kind of like dangerous other, unwanted other during that time. Uh, so without any reason that uh, he wasn't granted a passport, but all of a sudden in 2001, uh, he receives a, a notification saying that uh, your passport is ready. So it was, I think, within the frame of the EU accession process, yet democratic reforms. So that was maybe part of it because not only Hudan think many people uh, couldn't get passport uh, in this country in the past, especially after the military coup in the 90s. And I, we should say that, you know, it's still an existing problem, especially after the military coup attempt in Turkey in, Turkey in 2016. 
um, many people, thousands of people, they have travel bans still. Uh, many human rights activists, journalists, they cannot leave the country. So this fact in the past still sheds light on what's happening today as well. This is a practice. And some people, they go to the airport trying to exit the country and they learn that they have a travel ban uh, by the police officer in the airport. So it's an ongoing problem. And not only is uh, the passport didn't give him uh, freedom to travel either when I invited him to come to London. He said, oh, well, I'll have to, I'll see if I can get a visa. And we waited a long time for him to get a visa, really months and months and months. And he, they would go and come back and say, no, it's not ready. We haven't had it. And suddenly one day, yes, the visa came. And the next day he got on the, fl on the flight. Yeah. So a uh, passport, it was no guarantee for, for free travel. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, please. I'd just ask if either of you could tell us, please, how many thousands of Armenians live in Istanbul today? Sorry. Um, yeah. Number of Armenians in Istanbul today. How many Armenians, yes, live in Istanbul today? Karin, maybe you know better than me, but we don't have the exact figures. There's no statistics to be, that is. Uh, conducted uh, up until this date, but the estimated number is between 40,000 or 50,000. Um, but we cannot confirm this. Uh, I wish there was a kind of a survey or a specific study to identify this number. But this is the estimated number that we have because of the enrollment in the schools or like, you know, communities uh, in the church or like, you know, Sometimes patriarchate also mention uh, this number, um, but there are a lot of Islamized Armenians. <laughs> that's that's another thing. Karim, maybe uh, you know. I don't know. Do they still come to Argos, Karim? You're on mute. Um, yeah. No, sorry, Karim, you're on mute. We can't hear you. No, you were on. <laughs> Is it now? I couldn't uh, unmute myself. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as there is uh, no questions uh, asked about the uh, uh, mother tongue or uh, ethnic origins uh, during this uh population enrolling systems do not have exact numbers uh, we always play with uh estimations uh like nayat said it's okay maybe fifty thousand uh sometimes it's raised to eighty thousand people uh and apart from uh, istanbul there is only a small armenian uh village uh in the south uh hatay Vakuflukö, and uh more importantly, as Nayat also underlined, the, there is a huge number uh, of Islamized Armenians. And this was the last taboo actually Hranting uh, touched. And the foundation is uh, going uh, in this direction uh, as part of the uh, legacy again. Uh, because these are the uh, people actually connecting the recent history for both parties. Uh, apart from that, there are there is already a community of Arme Armenians from Armenia who are living also in Turkey, uh, and in uh, certain districts uh, we have this uh, centralized uh, life, but uh, it's all uh, spread. And actually, um, compared to the population, I would say uh, the word Armenian. Uh, weighs a lot so it's sometimes as if uh, we are millions of people uh, because uh, of the weight of this uh, word be it be it in a positive or uh, negative connotation another message here thank you nayat and karen not a question but a note of gratitude for your resilience and courage please tell us how we can support or contribute. 
we have an answer. Mm. Would you like to say something about that? I may be following our work, coming to our events, or like um, as the Ramping Foundation, we have many volunteers. I should say that not only from Turkey, but you know, Tur people from outside Turkey and diaspora, they want to contribute. Uh, sometimes they say, oh, we want to translate something, we can do some voiceovers. So we are open to any contribution, any support. And through those kind of uh, gatherings, uh, we have met with amazing people who later on contributed to our work. Uh, so please do get in touch uh, with us if you want to uh, come even to Turkey. We will be happy to host you at the foundation, at the memory site as well. We always believe the more the merrier and hope we can. Uh, become more all together. Thank you. Anyone else have a question here? Yes, please. There are prospects of diplomatic relations between Turkey and the Republic of Armenia. I was wondering what the attitude of, of the Turkish Armenians and the Turkish people themselves and the editorial guidance that's been given by our did you hear that? Yes. Uh, if you could hear me, your relation. Do Sorry. You, do you want to repeat the question? Sorry. Repeat the question. Oh, you want the question repeated? Can you repeat it, please? Uh, no, you can. Maybe, maybe you can repeat it, Nuritza, because yeah, okay. we hardly so, hear it. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll paraphrase. Ba basically, with the looming um, sort of discussions around uh, better relations between Armenia and Turkey, how do Turkish Armenians feel about that, and how do Turks feel about that, and what is the um, uh, what is the editorial approach to that at Agos? I think Karen, this is more of a question for you. I would I would say possibly. So uh, as far as uh, Agos is concerned, uh, I'm not uh, part of the uh, recent team. Uh, uh, so, uh, but of course I uh, follow as a reader. Uh, Agos has been very enthusiastic and eager and even uh, path, a path maker uh, during Hranting's uh, life. Uh, to come up uh, with good neighboring relations between Armenia and Turkey. But now when we look at this uh, ultra-nationalistic uh, atmosphere uh, all around the world, I would say, and uh, specifically also in Turkey, uh, remembering the echoes of uh, the latest um, uh, fights in Nagorno-Karabakh and how now the corridor is being blocked. Uh, there is a, a disinterest uh, and a lack of news or b a complete uh, side taking uh, in favor of Azerbaijan. So uh, the and whenever there is a conflict uh, with Armenia, there is also a race um, a rising. Um, tendency of uh, nationalistic uh, feelings. Uh, we should also not forget that the elections are uh, uh, close and uh, in a democratic country, maybe elections means a, a period of uh, joy, hope, campaigning and for us, but uh, there is also, and when I say for us, I speak as a citizen of Turkey, uh, always uh, do risk uh, the uh, fear of uh, bombings and a kind of provocations uh, because we have these uh, unfortunate experiences. So there is a, a tense uh, atmosphere, I would say, uh, which makes uh, the efforts, um, all the efforts of uh, human connection between the two people, two neighbors, be it. Uh, in cultural aspect or any other way uh, more precious uh, than ever and uh, both the foundation and the newspaper try to contribute to it because it's again part of uh, Hranting's heritage. Mm. Now, Maybe I should just add of... something on the foundation's work because one of our programs is dedicated to Turkey-Armenia relations program. 
uh, because Hulanting, when he was alive, like he was acting like an ambassador between two countries and he would defend that dialogue is our only recipe. So as the foundation, we have been conducting a lot of work in terms of like creating these channels of communication of these channels of meeting and dialogue through our travel grants, fellowship programs and dialogue groups we bring. Uh, people from both countries uh, of different professions. It could be journalists, it could be educators, artists. Um, but as you may guess, so far, maybe we supported more than 600 people for the travel grant. But <clears throat> we are now um, seeing the consequences of the war because it has created deep wounds in Armenia inevitably. So even people in Armenia who were more open for an open border now, uh, they don't want that because the wound is still there and it will take time to heal. And we know that it's challenging, it's not easy, but at the same time, we want to continue our work uh, to create this channels of dialogue as well. Um, because Kuranting described as like, two close societies, two distant neighbors, and uh, open border would be an, you know, way to approach the societies and, you know, to normalize the relations. But now um, it's harder than it was like five years ago. We have a long way to go and people should, uh, especially from Turkey, because when there was a war in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, of course, as uh, Karim mentioned, like there's escalation of hate speech against Armenians in Turkey as well. In parallel to that, uh, you become more vulnerable and the things uh, that you want to initiate between two countries becomes much more harder. Uh, but we will see like what will happen after the elections, because now in a couple of months, we will have the elections and we should be patient and see and make whoever is governing make more advocacy in that sense as well. Yes. Um, someone's, I want to say the answer is thank you so much for sharing your reflections in this deeply moving and well-researched event, deeply enriched, I feel, due to your personal connection to her and sharing this vision with us. And what message do you think Arant would want us to carry in his name to honor his memory? Mm -hmm. I don't know if either of you feel like you can answer that question. He, he doesn't have any like, quick and easy answer, I guess. I think you have, yes. Uh, well, uh, on the 15th of uh, September, on his uh, birthday, now we have this international hunting um, uh, foundation awards uh, submitted to human rights activists all around the world with the efforts of the uh, foundation. And uh, Nayat uh, knows uh, very well as well, there is always this footage uh, shown from 2006, when uh, Hrant Dink was invited uh, to Hamburg, Germany, uh, in order to receive the Henry Nunnen Award. There, this was a period when he was uh, made to a scapegoat within and uh, all and shared with awards from abroad, such a uh, turbulent time. And uh, during his speech, uh, he said, uh, Turkey is not a dark country, it is being lit up, and we endeavor to illuminate it. It was a time when uh, he was trapped from every possible corner. And this footage is shown, and uh, afterwards, uh, he uh, runs back, uh, He there is this applause, the ceremony proceeds solemnly, and all of a sudden he is seen on the stage again jumping, and under the quizzical uh, look for, of the host, uh, he grabs the award because he has forgotten uh, to take it with this uh, childish smile on his face, and th th this is such a typical uh, ranting moment, and uh, we laugh of course and then in a millisecond we remember why we are seeing this footage and why we are having this ceremony why he is not there 
And uh, then the words echo again. That country is not a dark country. It is being lit up and we endeavor to illuminate it. Um, that would be the sentence, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to have the, his memory, uh, both personally for us and for all the people, I say. Thank you. Yes, that's very fitting. Very fitting. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, now we have Naomi singing an, an Armenian folk song. I'm not Armenian, so I please excuse the pronunciation. The pronunciation is excellent. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know what the song says, I can't wait, but you made me wait. <laughs> Thank you so much, Naomi. It was very fitting with your interpretation. So um, I just would like to say that uh, there's a new film by Umit Kivansh, uh, System Memory Too Low for Words, in case you're uh, interested in that, it's on YouTube. If you can see it, my film is also on YouTube. And um, I just want to thank everyone who took part in this evening. It's always very moving and it's always very enriching because we learn so much every time as well. Um, I thank Nayat and Karin for joining us and we wish you strength and courage and for going forward in your invaluable work. I also would like to thank the family and, and we love you. We, we, we send our wishes, our best wishes. It's hard for you. You have such courage and such bravery to carry on the way you do and the wider family of, of Harantink and all those people who love you. Uh, I thank the Armin Institute for putting on this evening, Tatiana and Susan. Um, please do support the Harantink um, as foundation do support the Armenian Institute. It's good people who are going to make the world good. Thank you very much. Please stay and have a drink. Here.